When we ask for their input on something, we usually ask for their opinion. Can you give us your opinion on what we're thinking? Right? And that's a mistake. It turns out when you ask for someone's opinion, you get a critic. Somebody who steps away from you and then provides an evaluation of this idea or whatever it is that you're hoping, this new initiative that you're hoping to, to develop. If you change one word and ask for their advice rather than opinion, you get a partner. You get someone who's standing with you together and they like the idea better, significantly better, because they're part of it. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Or all of them. Why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. Today, we have a very special guest. Sheena, you know, once in a while, we get someone on the show that, you know, we admire mm -hmm. and respect everybody. But once in a while, we get a true idol, someone we really look up to. And I am beyond thrilled to say that we have Robert Cialdini joining us today on the show. So, Robert, thank you for hanging out with us. It truly is a pleasure. Well, thank you, Devin. I'm looking forward to our, our time together. So for those who don't know, you have one of the best books uh, that I, I would say of all time. I've read it. It was helpful when I was in sales. It's helpful now that I'm in marketing. It is truly required reading to anybody who joins my team. Uh, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, uh, New York Times bestseller, psychology classic. And uh, we're going to break apart a little bit of that today, but I know that you just hung out with us on an event where you talked about how we can apply those things to a sales role, sales interactions, to understand how people make choices. And so today what we're going to do is focus on how sales leaders can use your research to thrive internally with their orgs. How does that sound to you? Perfect. You know, it's, it, it follows a trajectory. When I give speeches or we do some training, uh, it's usually to sales or marketing audiences. But after a while, when the principles that we talk about have worked, people come back to say, you know, it's just as important to get, yes, it's just as important to get people on, our, on our, the same page as us inside the organizational envelope as outside. It means the same for profit. So can you come in and talk to us about how the principles of influence work internally. So I'm glad to do that today. Lovely, lovely. Well, I'm looking forward to it because like I said, I've read the book, but I haven't gotten this version. So I'm, I'm excited. Um, maybe, Robert, do you want to give us kind of a high level overview of these principles? And then we can go into how they apply day to day for our leaders? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about the principles that uh, lend themselves to stronger relationships, uh, to closer connections that people feel to one another. There are four. And by the way, the evidence is very powerful that if you can get those stronger relationships, you're more likely to get a yes in any request or proposal or recommendation. There was a study done by KPMG. Uh, they had their, um, their partners describe various kinds of business sales attempts where they're trying to get new business and they rated the extent to which they were successful in terms of how much uh, how strong the relationship was when they made the request if the relationship was weak they got about a 36 percent uh, success rate if it was moderate they got a 65 percent success rate. If it was strong, they got a 76%. So this, the bond is crucial as a lever for change, a lever for assent. People want to do business with those they like. 
Well, if that applies internally, I now know why I can't say no to Sheena. Anytime she asks me for a favor or a help, I'm, 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 I'm increasing that average. So that makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, we can talk about the four principles that I think I, uh, give us that kind of traction. Uh, the first is uh, the principle of reciprocation. The one that says people want to give back to those who have first given to them. So, depending on what you want inside the office, let's say you want a better attitude. Come in with a better attitude. Let's say you want the, your, the people to give you, your people to give you better information so you can do your job more efficient, effic, uh, efficiently and effectively. Make sure you give them the information they need to do their job. And... It's an automatic tendency. They will give back to you what you have given to them. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that's just a no-brainer. It exists in every human culture. I'm sure you're dealing with people in your team who may not have been born in this culture or grown up here. It doesn't matter. This rule was trained into every child in every human culture. You must not take without giving in return. And people say yes to those they owe. So if we go first and we provide benefits, advantages, they're going to flow back to us. So that's the principle of reciprocation. Then there's one that everybody will nod to. It's the principle of liking. People like to say yes to those they like, right? And, uh, that everybody knows that, but there are two small things we can do to increase the sense of rapport that people feel with us. One is to identify genuine commonalities that exist between us and raise them to the surface. We like those who are like us. <laughs> and if we just show them that we have these parallels, they're more likely to want to, uh, to do business with us, to say yes to us, and so on. Uh, the other is... Uh, praise, genuine praise. Not only do we like people who are like us, we like people who do like us and say so. So if we give them genuine praise, I mean, they feel really positive about us. There's a connection there that makes them feel like uh, there's a rapport and that tilts them toward yes uh, when we ask for a favor or request. Uh, next principle is the principle of commitment and consistency. Right? People want to be consistent with what they have already committed themselves to, decisions they have made, actions they have taken. If we can show people inside our group or uh, that what we're asking is congruent with what we know about them, the things they value, the things they prioritize, and we show them that there's a connection there, well, they're more likely to say yes, and they're more likely to feel good about us because we've taken the time to really understand them, to know them as people, right? Um, so uh, commitment and con consistency is, uh, is a strategy, and... and uh, if we don't know a lot about them, we can begin by asking questions of them. Can you tell me what are your goals? What are your your aspirations? And so, and when they've put themselves on record, we can then say, well, what I'm suggesting that we do together is completely consistent with what you just said. How important it is that there be quality and transparency or ethics or uh, a profit involved in what, what the changes that you make. Here's what we're going to do to make sure that that commitment that you have to those particular values are, uh, are, are commitments that you can realize. And then finally, there's a new principle of influence that I call uh, unity. The perception that you and the other person are partners what I call we relationships, where people feel they are not just like the other person, they are of that, that group, that, that 
entity in which they share. Uh, if, if I were to say, you know, um, Devin is like us, that's one thing. If I were to say, Devin is one of us, everybody in the group now feels more positively toward Devin because he's one of us. So that kind of that kind of connection, it's not just similarity, it's belonging together in the same unit. It's interesting how just, you know, changing how you phrase something even minimally can have a huge impact on how it's perceived on the other end. Exactly. And it will have a huge result on the end, the impact uh, you know, the work that that person provides or how they engage with you and that long-term relationship building. Exactly right. This is, this is one of the things I love about the, 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 uh, the psychology of influence. It involves changing just some small things uh, about the way you mm -hmm. phrase something, the way you sequence your request. Some small wording shifts engage big psychological um, levers within us. They press those levers. They get that action because uh, we've now connected to people in a, 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 a genuine way. So I think some of these principles may come very natural, you know, may come very naturally to some folks. And for others, this is new, or at least some of the principles may feel new to them. How do you suggest that folks incorporate these principles into their day to day without it feeling forced um, on, you know, from the recipient's end? Yeah. And so one of the things this is a really good point, because, you know, I wrote a whole book on this and your audience members can't walk around with that book on a chain around their necks, right? And be, every time they come to an end, Devin might. I've actually got it under the sweater. No, no. Well, it turns out that we have available and we're willing to give, probably through you folks, anybody who asks a PDF of a little card that we give, a little plastic card with the principles of influence on it, and hints as how to use each of those principles when you come upon an influence situation. So that's something you can put in a pocket or a purse or a wallet. And every time you, you know, come to a situation where you want to be influential, check the card. Just check what's available to you there. Is there a real we relationship that already exists? Point to that. Is there a genuine similarity? Is there... A, you know, uh, uh, is there a genuine commitment that this person has already made that's consistent with where you want that person to go next? Point to that commitment. So if, if you can remind yourself of these rules, these principles of influence, then you're, you're pre-armed to employ them when, uh, when appropriate. Um, I'm going to call you Bob because you asked me to, Bob, yes. uh, Bob which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I feel, like, I feel like I'm one of you now when I'm in your inner, <laughs> unity and play when you offered me to, to call you Bob. Um, what, there's a lot. Um, I, you did a great job breaking down each one, kind of the what and the why. So that's why Sheena and I are interested. Like, okay, you did such a you know, concise job there. How can we apply some of these things? Um, one I'd like to start with is commitment. And... Um, I have actually an idea or a question for you. If you can use the law of, of commitment to help people change their mind. Now, here's kind of a scenario that I ran into, which was someone, uh, you know, someone, one of our colleagues here kind of like, you know, had this project they were working on. And they were fully committed. Maybe they said they're committed or not, but we all could tell they're very committed. And something had changed out of their control, which essentially made that project kind of null and void. Like it didn't make sense to do it anymore. Right. Mm. They had committed to it. And so they were mm. trying to find a way and they're trying to push through and they're providing all of these different options. Now, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but this book comes to my mind where I'm like, maybe this person has the law of commitment. Right. You know, they've committed so deeply to something that they're unable to consider uncommitting that. I'm curious if that's, you know, kind of commonplace or if there's anything else you can kind of unpack of kind of being aware of where maybe employees or colleagues have committed and where it's, you know, it's possible to kind of reframe that and say, hey, it's actually okay to uncommit. Yes. And I think the thing to do, once again, is to be authentic and to say, 
you know, we really appreciate the commitment that you showed. That's impressive. You know, that's going to that's going to steer you in the right direction in your future. The being willing to do that. In this particular instance, you know that that commitment you had to the task, that was that was commendable. But the truth is, the circumstances have changed. The conditions have changed that make that commitment no longer viable for this task. We love the commitment, but we need to move that commitment, that ability, you know, to to be uh, to to concentrate your effort and and prioritize in terms of a particular uh, purpose. We need to move that to another task where uh, it will bear fruit for all of us. I'd love to get your perspectives on some of these principles and how they apply in this more remote and distributed environment. I can imagine some things like liking and reciprocity are much uh, easier to come by when you're face to face with folks in the office. It's, you know, the ability to connect on things that are similar when you're just having a conversation in the in the cafeteria, mm -hmm. for example, or across from desks. So how do you think about these principles at play when we're in this well, hybrid take, world? Or fully sure, let's take those folks? two that you mentioned. And I agree, they're difficult ones uh, when, when you have uh, uh, remote contact with people. But one of the things for reciprocity, for example, that's been shown, reciprocation, is send people white papers, send people information that will help them with their business ahead of time. You go first and give them something. Send them uh, an article that says the three biggest mistakes to avoid in your particular situation or the top 10 hints for uh, saying the right thing at the right time. Whatever it is, it shouldn't be something designed to increase uh, the uh, profile of your business because then it's not a gift. Then it's just a marketing strategy. But it should be something designed to help you do better, get better outcomes in what you do. You send those things on a regular basis. You send them ahead to the people uh, in your, um, uh, your audience and uh, th you've done them a favor. And they know it. And so when you come uh, around, uh, they're ready to give you one in return. Now, liking. Right? Uh, I saw an article of 6,700 online commercial sites, a, a review of those sites, where they did A-B tests to see which factors in those sites were most likely to produce a conversion from a visitor to a, a customer, right? And they had all kinds of uh, uh, factors. There was there were some that were economic, like we'll give you free shipping. Some were technological. Uh, there's a search function inside the site. Some were psychological. Did was there an ask? Uh, was there uh, a call to action? at the end of, of every interaction, these kinds of things. Well, one of the top converters was whether on the site there was a welcoming letter to people as they landed on the site, somebody said, hi, welcome, we're so glad to have you. The sort of thing you would do if somebody came to your home or somebody came to your brick and mortar uh, business, you would welcome them in a positive way, which would increase liking. We can do that. Why not? In, instead of a landing page that just has a lot of information, or welcome them first and welcome them, usher them in to your, um, your products and services. I mean, I think the same thing even applies for internal communication. For example, sometimes I receive requests over Slack with somebody asking a very direct question. It may be somebody I have never met at my company or somebody I met six months ago, but they're, 
you know, it's a very direct question. Do you know this person? Can you make an introduction? Then there are other folks who will actually take that time yeah. to be more welcoming, get to know yeah. me for, you know, a couple of minutes and then make the ask. And there it's a very different it dynamic. Is. I must it say. is. It's that connection. And, you know, the more we become electronically mediated in terms of our connection, the more we miss the humanity of uh, a cordial interaction before we begin the business process. And the more we can, mm -hmm. we can replace that online, the better. I saw an article that showed that uh, if in a negotiation the bargainers shake hands first before they begin, right, both sides have better outcomes because they like one another more. Right? There's a, there is a, a statement of cooperation, intent to cooperate. Well, if you're online or you're doing a, a, a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, on, have it start with an image of a handshake. Why not? Why not build that back in? Because it's possible. It's just uh, we, we do it online instead of... The other thing about this that I always liked was that it seemed to me that these um, negotiations that were better when there was an initial handshake at the beginning of the negotiation, I always thought to myself, you know what? If I was one of those negotiators, after lunch, I'd shake hands again. I'd do it again. I'd have a, an, a, a, a reinforcement of the extent to which there's an intent to cooperate and and uh, to to mutually succeed. Yeah, it's interesting. There's some studies behind that because Sheena, to your point about Slack, I have noticed where my some uh, in my head I'm like I guess it's a sign of familiarity. Why would Sheena? I can just get straight to the point. We know each other. We talk pretty frequently. I'm gonna get right to it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Joe on the sales team who I've never spoke to or haven't spoken to a lot, I'll definitely make sure, hey, Joe, how's it going? Here's why, you know, a little a little bit more of that intro. So I viewed it a little more casually, but it does make a lot of sense. And Sheena, maybe before we make an ask, uh, we just put the little handshake emoji in Slack before <laughs> we talk to you. Oh, okay, that's right. Friendship, yeah. and unity, and I like you. And uh, we'll get in, we'll get into the actual ask. I'd love to dig into unity. Uh, if you're up to it, one, it's yeah. it's the new the new kid on the block uh, of the principles. But I think, too, is like as we, you know, Gina and I talk to a lot of leaders about trying to build, you know, evolve their culture, high, you know, whether they're hybrid, fully remote. And I think it's easy for teams to lose sight of their mission statement and, you know, the kind of like the mission of the company. When, you know, you're in your home office, your living room working day to day and you don't get those connections that we're all you know used to. So I'm curious, Bob, if you have any examples of maybe how leaders can really bring that, you know, that unity mindset. Right. And so one thing that maybe came to mind is you're saying, hey, we have to show that we're truly partners. I know right. one, one way might be and you can correct me, like could be like co-creating things together. Right. When people both come to the table, even if I only contributed five or 10 percent. I'm going to feel like I had bigger contribution, be more bought in. Uh, and I'm just speaking, you know, for myself. So is that something that you would prescribe as like co-creating when possible? Is there, are there other things that leaders could be doing as well? Yes, there is. You are right on the target. Co-creation is crucial with our customers, right? They become more satisfied. They become more loyal if they, if we've asked them into the interaction uh, with the, uh, the development of our next um, stage or model or product and so on. But there's an aspect that fits not only outside but inside. When we ask for their input on something, right, we usually ask for their opinion. Can you give us your opinion on what we're thinking? Right? And that's a mistake. It turns out when you ask for someone's opinion, you get a critic. Somebody who steps away from you, right? not in a partnership way, but steps away from you with a distance and then provides an evaluation of this idea or whatever it is that you're hoping, this new initiative that you're hoping to, to develop. If you change one word, 
and ask for their advice rather than opinion, you get a partner. You get someone who's standing w with you together. And the research is amazing. It shows that if you ask for advice rather than opinion, you get better f feedback. You get better uh, uh, input into what it can be done to improve the thing or how you can uh, present it and so on. And they like the idea better, significantly better, because they're part of it. The newest research shows you get exactly the same effect if you, instead of, instead of using the word, can you give me your feedback on this? You say, can you give me your advice on this? Same thing happens, right? Advice is a partnership associated word and it wins the day. Now, let me give you one other example. It's one that I had of how to manage using Unity. Uh, a while ago, I, I needed some help on a project. Uh, I needed a, a colleague of mine in the psychology department where I work to give me uh, some data he had collected the previous year for a report I was writing that was due the next day. Well, I, I sent him an email. And I said, Tim, I told him my situation. Can you go to your, I'm going to ask you if you can go to your archives and get the data out and send them to me today because I need it, right? But I'm going to call you and talk about how to do this. So I called him and this guy, let's call him Tim, who was known to be a kind of irascible, sour character. You know, He said, I know why you're calling Bob. And the answer is no. Look, you need the day today. I can't be your, uh, I can't be in charge of your poor time management skills, Bob. That's up to you. So no. And before I had read this research on unity, here's what I would have said. Come on, Tim. I need this. It's due the next day. He had already said no to that. In fact, he had made a commitment to it. So how do I? I said, come on, Tim. We've been members of the same psychology department for 12 years now. I really need this. I had the data that afternoon. Wow. I, I reminded him of a connection we have. And the power, I mean, the rules of this, this is what we do for the people who are of us, who are partners with us. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. We help them. And I'll give you one more example. Keep them coming. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't, uh, okay. So, and how, how often we can just find uh, instances of particular kinds of unities. I grew up in the state of Wisconsin. And the NBA football team there is the Green Bay Packers. So I'm a Green Bay Packer fan, always been my whole life. And I read a newspaper article a little while ago that said there are two celebrities, Justin Timberlake and Lil Wayne, who are avid Green Bay Packers fans. Devin and Sheena, I immediately thought better of their music. <laughs> And secondly, I wanted them to succeed more. Interesting. They were Packer fans like me. They were of my, they were one of us. So whenever we can find those unity opportunities to bring to the surface, that's going to be gold. Mm -hmm. Those are fantastic examples. I've got my, I, Gina knows my thinking face, or at least my writing face as I'm writing some examples down. Um, what I like about the we're, into this, we're in this together concept, Bob, was you, you were very specific. You didn't say, come on, Tim, we're in this together. That wouldn't have been enough. They get in together for what? And I think sometimes you see that in marketing. You know, we're in this together, and you're like, in yeah. what? Like, I don't, what, what, are we, what are you talking about? But you said, hey, we've been in the same department insinuating we have the same mission. We've been committed to this for 12 years. And so I think that extra specificity 
it's probably why it was so powerful. Like I was kind of like, I, I, I wish I was in that psych department. It sounds like they're on a mission. I want to be part of that too. Right. So if you're ever in a position of have, trying to move one of your colleagues in your direction and you have a long-term c- connection with that colleague, start out by saying, you know, we've been together for a long time. That's the preface. That's the prologue. And everything that follows then becomes more positively colored. So, Bob, you've probably worked with a lot of leaders who maybe were not exemplifying all of these uh, pillars um, in how they engage with their teams. Tell us a little bit about the downside. What happens to folks who maybe don't exemplify one or any of these um, approaches in their day to day? Let's take one uh, with reciprocation. Have you ever done a really big favor for somebody? You go beyond the call of duty and and you put out this effort and you get it done and that person says, thank you, I really appreciate that. And here's what I've heard a lot of people say in response. Oh, don't think anything of it. It's no big deal. Just part of the job, right? No. Don't say that. You earn that moment. It's a moment that's dominated by the principle of reciprocation. Don't slap it away. Don't dismiss it. Don't minimize it. So that's the wrong thing to do. But we do it out of politeness or something, right? Here's what I recommend you say to somebody in the organization under those circumstances. Of course, I was glad to do it. It's what we do for one another here. It's what we do for one another here. You put it on the map. And when you need, and this person is going to nod, yep, that's what we do. And when you have, now when you need a favor, this person is on record knowing that this is what we, what you expect that we do for one another. Right? Yeah. There's a commitment there. It feels like a uh, quadruple whammy. It's like all of the principles kind of put together, right? I know, <laughs> right. honestly, it's like you're going to like somebody more. I, I'm guessing, Bob, you correct me where I'm wrong. You're going to like somebody more. You touched on the law of reciprocity. To me, it's almost like a commitment to return that favor. It's like, oh, this is what we do. Well, I'm in this That's group right. and I'm committed to the group. Therefore, I'm committed to this kind of code, if you will. And then that unity was, this is what we do. So if you're going to keep Keep on, we, keeping on with us. Yeah, this is what we're using doing. the term we. You know, I, I, I think one thing that I like to do sometimes when I'm talking to salespeople, sales managers, and so on, is define what I mean or what, what constitutes effective sales. What, what leads to effective sales? Right? These principles that we talked about, they all do that. Mm-hmm. But there's one thing that I don't. I don't have structured within the the principles, and that is empathy. If we can put ourselves in the position of our um, of the recipient of our message, think about that person not in terms of your goals, your purposes, why you're there, and so. But what is that? What what are those things for that individual? That allows you to resonate with those um, goals and, and, and uh, wishes of, of that particular individual, which then really gives you an, an open window to how you should approach uh, that particular sale. If you understand that person's needs and challenges and put yourself in that person's position before you begin your strategy, it changes how you, uh, how you proceed. Lovely. Lovely. Sheena, should we go to the final question? Let's do it. All right. Go for it. All right. Bob, there's one question we did not prepare you for, but I am fully confident that you will be able to handle it. And we ask all of our guests this question, which is, how would you describe sales in one word? Oh, well, that's nice because I just gave you the answer by saying I'm going to cheat and give you two words. What is, what, how do I describe effective sales? 
effective sales is through empathy with your customer, your prospect. So good. I like it. I love it. It really connects all four of the pillars together from right. empathy. Well, Bob, it has been a pleasure. I started with that. Uh, if I started liking you, and I'll tell you what, I continue to like you. I'm committed to liking you. Oh, uh, great. So thank you truly for hanging out, uh, sharing your wisdom and a lot of really cool research and insights. We appreciate it.